Cheryl, please join me on stage. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Can you guys hear me okay? So uh, this was kind of funny because <clears throat> Jerry called me up and he said, I got a special job for you at Migration if you'll come. I want you to drive a Jeep into the hangar. And I said, uh, tell me about the Jeep. He said, I think it's about a 1984 CJ7. And I said, I'm in. Because my first car in high school was a 1980 CJ7, my pride and joy. And <clears throat> my friends and I became somewhat famous by parking that Jeep on the stage of our high school as a senior prank. <laughs> One thing I learned is if you park your own car on the high school stage, you're probably going to get caught. <laughs> and then Jerry said, well, and if you're going to come, then I want you to do this speaking thing on Monday night. You're going to do the same thing that Don Marinelli did last year. How many of you guys heard Don speak? How many of you remember what he talked about? But how many of you thought he was awesome when he was doing it? <laughs> right. So <clears throat> I'm not Don. I'm going to talk about pragmatic things that I hope we can remember next year, but I won't do it with half his flair or his sense of humor, and I'm sure not going to do it with his hairdo. <laughs> I think what we all have in common is that we, all, we love airplanes. They have to be masterfully flown to get maximum advantage, and it's a lifelong pursuit to fly an airplane well. You never do it as well as you'd like to do. There's always something to strive for. So the people in this room think proficiency is one of the great joys of flying airplanes as I do. And so this is about having a passion for proficiency, something we have in common, and trying to turn that into the greater good for pilots like ourselves all around this country and frankly around the world. And so I want to tell you why I'm here. First and foremost, I'm a pilot. I think the reason why I'm interested in proficiency is because it matters to me. I don't think I'm a good enough pilot. I think I have so much to learn, but I like learning. And even though I fly a lot, uh, I remain devoted to the craft. And you can never be good enough. So I'm a pilot first. And secondly, I'm in the industry as a manufacturer. I work for Hartzell Propeller. My customers are the reason why I get to do what I get to do. Work in a shop, engineer products, fly airplanes too. And I want them to be great pilots. And I want them to beget great pilots by encouraging their friends or their children to fly airplanes. Because I'm in the industry, I also belong to a lot of associations. Because I'm a pilot, I belong to a lot of associations. And I, I told you guys this last year, if you were here. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm in a unique point of connection between EAA and AOPA and General Aviation Manufacturers Association and Recreational Aviation Foundation, plus industry. And I'm hearing a lot of perspectives. And there's a growing interest in working together to drive proficiency. There is so much interest in making pilots fly more expertly, because there's so much to gain. So I'm sitting in the middle of a lot of folks, and I'm on the board of a few of these, so I get a little bit of authority from time to time to try some stuff. And EAA has uh, invoked a new committee called the Training and Proficiency Committee, and I'm on that committee. And our mission is to drive proficiency by partnership. And so I guess for you in this room, I want to tell you I see a problem. And in that problem, I also see an opportunity. And the problem is that people running flight schools, people making their living as a CFI, don't have enough customers. You don't have enough customers because we're not creating enough new pilots. And the pilots we've created don't seek enough training. So I told you this last year, and I'm going to tell you again. I want you to have more customers. And that is one of the things I'm trying to dedicate my free time to in the industry. When I think about pilots, and I think about myself even up until, I don't know, maybe five years ago, being a pilot usually meant going for a rating. That's when you saw a CFI. That's when you might have engaged a flight school. Or it meant getting your flight review or BFR at the time. And BFRs weren't training. They were pass-fail. So I look back at my own career, and I said, the only time I ever was training was when I was getting my private and my instrument. And then I looked at the pro pilots that flew in our flight department at Hartzell, and they train all the time. 
They train for skill building's sake. They don't train to pass something, they train to be proficient. And they do it very regularly, annually, it's required. And guess what, they're better pilots, period. So I got to thinking, that's what we need. We need the everyday pilot to train like a pro. Pros train for proficiency, they're better pilots, they're safer pilots. Why can't we do that at the level of the general aviation pilot? Well, there were a lot of reasons why that wasn't very practical, but those reasons are going away fast, and that's what's very exciting. So there's been this alliance, I would call it, a very loose alliance. It's not like there's some organization out there that has decided to take on proficient, proficiency. What's happened is a gathering of friends in the aviation industry have been working together to try some new things to create more customers for you. And the question we've been asking ourselves are, is there a better way to train general aviation pilots? If there was a better way, could we get them to go take that training? Just because you can do it doesn't mean they will. And then lastly, if they did take that training, would they be safer pilots? So those are the questions we've been asking ourselves. Who are these folks asking these questions? Well, EAA is a big part of this. They've, they've put a lot of capital and energy into trying to take on proficiency in a new way. IMC Club has done so as well by working in partnership with us to, boot, to do proficiency initiatives at AirVenture. NAFI and SAFE have been unbelievable, unbelievable, because nobody gets training without a CFI. Nobody gets training without a, a flight training professional. And in fact, there's folks in this room, members of both SAFE and NAFI who have been a big part of this. Will you guys raise your hands if you've been part of this proficiency initiative we're gonna describe? Could you actually stand up? So these, these guys are helping us imagine a better way for training general aviation pilots. Pretty neat. We'll talk about these guys more in a minute and what they did results-wise. So those are the individual CFIs. And on the company side, Redbird, it seems like every time I wanna do something that involves proficiency, I call Redbird. And this Redbird staff is probably one of the most creative entrepreneurial staffs I've come across in business. Whether it's rebuilding a Jeep or, or making this display or building equipment to make pilots safer, they just find a way to get things done. So Redbird's been huge in this. Jeppesen has been fantastic. This is a Boeing company. We're talking about a Fortune 10 company on the ground at Oshkosh trying to help GA pilots fly smarter and better. Hartzell Propeller. Mindstar Aviation, Pilot Edge, which is a little company, so is Mindstar. Their, their founders and CEOs sat at Oshkosh for a week straight making pilot proficiency their primary job at Oshkosh, never mind the booth traffic they might have been missing. That's how much they care about this. Flying Magazine did a huge piece of promotional work for this, drawing a crowd to our center. You'll see more what promotion did for us, and uh, David Clark. Okay, we don't have anything in common. We just like airplanes and pilots, and we're all getting together trying to make something happen. That's the point. It's pretty grassroots right now. So what have our goals been, this loose alliance? Well, the first goal was to build a proficiency center at Oshkosh. And I talked to you guys about this briefly last year if you were here. We want to imagine a neighborhood at Oshkosh so that when pilots go there, they see proficiency as a feature and a theme and it alerts them to the notion that professional training is available. But they don't know if they don't see. So we wanted a destination that showcased what your flight schools can do with your equipment and your talent. And what we wanted to showcase in particular, which is huge for me, is scenario-based training. You can go fly all the stalls you want, but if you don't fly a base to downwind with a smoke and crosswind that might blow you through final, you don't understand really the situation that will get you in trouble. But if you get in a sim and you fly that thing over and over and over again, you get the sight picture for how wind, weather, vector, aircraft, and you all work together under challenging circumstances. So scenario-based skill building is a huge part of this center. Big part is in a simulator, you can practice without risk. You can master something without ever turning the key. And there's, of course, a huge cost advantage to using flight uh, training devices. So this neighborhood, this destination in the proficiency center was very significantly focused around using flight training devices. We also wanted to have those things staffed with pros. Can you imagine 
going and sitting down at a simulator with nobody next to you that knows how to work it. Can you imagine firing it up and your reaction is going to be, oh, this doesn't fly like my airplane. I don't want any part of it. Now imagine sitting right next to you as a pro, an instructor who's seen every pilot have that reaction, talks you off the ledge, and gets you getting the value very quickly. Well, the CFIs in this room that stood up and something like 30 more like them sat at Oshkosh for a week while strangers walked in and sat at simulators and did scenario-based flying and coached them through. And it was all voluntary. And we also did, I think, 18 Tech Talk forums. We called them Tech Talks. These were 18 incredible uh, pieces of training. Taylor, are you here? Taylor Albrecht did one, a couple hundred people, standing room only, did it twice. Plus, he did one at a general Oshkosh forum. But in our proficiency center, we had that level of training going on every day. And uh, the whole idea is that we're going to have people so excited about what training could mean that they're going to call you. Well, until they do, the job's not done. But that's the vision. So I'm going to just show you a quick set of pictures. So this was a big operation, this proficiency training center. That looks like a tent to you. Let me tell you that if you want to go buy a 5,000 square foot house, that's how big this is. It's 5,000 square feet. Inside that thing was a pilot ready room where you'd walk in and be greeted and signed up and, and uh, sort of walk through what to expect. But over on the left hand back side, there was a simulator room with eight uh, TDs doing IFR scenarios with live ATC. When you sat down and fired up, you were talking to SoCal Approach through a company called Pilot Edge. You could see the flush rise on people's necks as they're flying a needles-based approach, no flight director, no autopilot, into SoCal at minimums with a guy giving them vectors. It's really powerful. Over on the right-hand side, there was another sim room that had six LDs with the kind of visual fidelity that made stick and rudder scenarios really powerful. And these stick and rudder scenarios were graphically awesome. One was summer camping at Johnson Creek, and you're shooting a canyon landing into Johnson Creek with pitch and power and spot landing skills on display. There was another one called Plenty of Spice at Spicewood. I don't know how many of you have landed at Spicewood, Texas. I have about 30 times in the simulator. I'll probably never do it in real life. It looks pretty scary to me. It's up on a bluff. It's a 30-foot wide runway, I think. And we had a screaming crosswind. If you can't fly a crosswind crab to a slip, you can't land on that runway. And we had you know, kids and dads trying this out. This is real proficiency skill on display. So that was in that back room. And then on the room on the right, we had a 200-person seat tech talk forum. And we ranged from sometimes booking 50, 60 people in to standing room only, depending on the session. Um, but the point is, we ran a lot of people through training. And I'll show you more about that in a minute. It was kind of neat. I mean, that was sort of an average day. People walking around, dads and daughters, dads and sons, and stuff full of CFIs ready to teach. And it looked like this. And you can't see it so well, but you might see back there there's a gentleman, I can't aim, in a white hat. You see how all those people are sitting tall in the back row? We called those sidekick chairs. Because there were people that wanted to see what was going on in the sim flying, but they didn't want to be the guinea pig. They didn't want to be embarrassed. So they'd go in, they'd sit in these chairs, and they'd watch somebody else do it. And they'd pretty soon feel comfortable enough to go sit down. So we think that we demonstrated something for folks just by watching the power of scenario-based sim training. So I'll give you the numbers. We've been working on this for a few years. This was, I think it was our third year. We got about a quarter of a million dollars invested in bringing this proficiency center online. Uh, that's buying simulators at. Uh, you know, sweetheart deals so we could own them and operate them. And it's, it's bringing in CFIs and putting them up in a dorm. It's not the greatest living in the world. Rental cars, promotional materials, about a quarter of a million bucks. It's going to cost about 125 to 130 to do it every single year. And so far, that's been paid for by the industry companies on that list. <clears throat> we had a 5,000 square foot tent, as I said, with the two training rooms and 14 sims. About 30 volunteers working as staff. Um, we had 3,250 pilots come through in six days. And I don't know what you should expect, but I can tell you this. 3,250 pilots 
never saw the power of the things you can do in your flight schools if they didn't see it at Oshkosh in all of its scope. I really think we introduced that to a lot of people. And 1,000 of those 3,250 people took sim sessions. So a lot of them watched it. A lot of them had their buddy do it. But 1,000 of them flew sims, and 3,250 came through for training. And our tech talk obviously made up about a couple thousand of those folks. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing. All we did was showcase. But they are customers we have to follow up with. Because they're waiting to be told where they can do more of this. So that gets us on to phase two. And this is the part of the process we're starting now. I hope nobody takes offense at this. But we need to develop a training network that builds skills. Yeah, you guys can do all the flight reviews and, and private pilot and instrument ratings and multi-engine commercials you want. We want you to do that. But that's not enough. We need to get pilots to think about building skills. And the way that I think about this is um, SimCom and flight safety have very specific skill building curriculum for people with pretty expensive airplanes, often whom are having their training paid for. And, and I'm sure you guys have either done it or know of it or know exactly what I'm talking about. It's very much a program of training you can buy. It's expensive, but it's very comprehensive. And until you get into a certain type of aircraft, you probably don't come across it. But there are so many pilots that can do something very similar with the kind of flight training devices available in the market today, such as the ones Redbird makes. They weren't in the market 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So we can have SimCom and flight safety for everybody if they're interested at a price point they can afford. That's the theory, and that's the theory we're going to test. Well, how are we going to get this done? It's early days, but we've got a lot of commitment. The first one is to broaden the partnership and promote this like crazy. I want you just to imagine something. I want you to imagine that EAA and AOPA and the RAF and the Seaplane Association and NAFI and SAFE all make a commitment to have some month of the year be General Aviation Pilot Proficiency Month. And the editor-in-chief, the plane and pilot genius editor-in-chief, would address pilot proficiency that month directly and would do feature articles on proficiency and have guest columnists doing proficiency. And the same would be true at AOPA. And the same would be true at EAA. And imagine their monthly newsletters for the next 12 months thereafter always had a proficiency feature. So think about this. Do you guys ever remember that movie, Gladiator, with Russell Crowe? Go with me on this. Just bear with me, please. <laughs> At the beginning of that movie, there's a hillside full of archers. And across the valley, there is a gathering of, of German marauders. And not that I think pilots are German marauders. Hear me out. The thing about that scene was that everybody on the hillside pointed their arrows at the same thing. And because of that, they had an incredible ability to deliver something powerful. Now, I can't remember a time in industry where every single organization that has a voice, whether it be a publication voice or a newsletter voice or an editor-in-chief voice, all said the same thing at the same time to the same people, and that thing was a proficiency message. Can any of you ever remember that happening? OK. So I'm thinking, if we can get 3,250 people to stop by a tent, we can reach 100,000 people with our voices and say exactly the same thing. And we can do it over and over and over. Now, I think that's building a marketplace. I think that would be easy to do. I think by the end of this year, we could probably have a commitment to do that kind of communication about proficiency. So what? Well, we have to tell those people what to do next. And what I imagine, and many people imagine, is that we will direct them to what I'm going to call a sanctioned curriculum. It doesn't matter what flight school you are. It doesn't matter how many pilots you have. There's a module of training you're prepared to deliver to a pilot like me or you that walks in as a retail customer. And if they take that module from you, they're going to be a better pilot when they're done, plain and simple. They're going to get crosswinds from the left, crosswinds from the right, pitch and power, the kinds of bad piloting that pilots fly into loss of control accidents all the time. And we can remediate that by building those skills. 
So we're going to tell everybody to come see you. We're going to ask you to offer a, a sanctioned curriculum, which will be developed in some kind of partnership. And that curriculum will include classroom flight and FTD exercises. And I think we can get pilots flying better quickly. And if we drive the traffic to the flight schools and you have what they came for, then all we got to do is get them to do it again. Some kind of recurrent program. Now, this sounds so simple. Maybe it's not going to be, but it doesn't seem like we have to invent anything at all. It just seems like we have to build the framework and attraction. So we need help from you. I guess at the end of the day, there's probably an ask of you all, and we're going to find a way to somehow get the flight school's voice and skills into this conversation. But the theory is that if you want a pilot to train like the pros, then they got to go to professional training organizations. That's the only way they can get professional level training. And when they get there, they have to get something they expect, which is organized professional curriculum that works them out. It's like golf. I can go from a, actually, I'm a terrible golfer. But if I was a good golfer, I think I could go from an 18 to a 16 to a 14 if I kept working on my skills. Well, I think a pilot can do the same thing. Do you guys think that? OK. So they got to come in and get that skill building, and then they got to be able to get it again. And flight schools, this is the big one, they have to deliver those services. I go to SimCom. I have to. It's an insurance requirement. When I call them up, they're not surprised to hear from me. And they're not surprised about what I want. They are ready to deliver the same thing year in and year out to keep me current from an insurance basis. So we need flight schools to deliver services like that in a loose alliance. <clears throat> they have to do it at an expected level of service. If I call up a flight school in Ohio that's on the Redbird recommended list, the imagined flight list, and nobody answers the phone, then we're not connecting with that would-be customer. So there's something around flight schools in every small business that's striving to cover their costs and build market at the same time. It's a very, very, very fine line. But somehow we have to live at a standard of excellence that will render the service in a way that pilots will, will appreciate. And the other thing is, is it takes a long view. You, flight schools would have to take a long view, view because I know you want to sell airplane time. You've got to cover the cost of your capital assets, and you've got to cover your cost of your fixed salaries and so on. And when somebody comes in and says, I just want to do an hour in a sim, they may not be, on that day, the best billing hour you're going to get. But if you got eight hours that year from that guy, and then his friend came and gave you eight hours, then maybe it starts to look like a pretty good part of your business. I don't know. I don't run a flight school. But what we have to think about is the long-term view of building customers, because there are flight schools that deliver all of their value without ever going in an airplane. There is a demand for ground and simulation-based training to complement a flight regime. So the question that I hope gets worked out here during this session from you all as you think about Imagine Flight is can the people in this room be the first movers? If the people I'm working with could deliver you a batch of pilots ready for training, could you receive them with an expert sanctioned curriculum delivered at a high level of professionalism? Because if you can, I think we're going to change the world when it comes to pilot safety. And I think that would be a great thing to say we achieved together using the technology that you all possess today. So let's go back to the questions, and this is my last slide. Is there a better way to train GA pilots? Yep. We can train them like the pros. We have the technology and resources, resources to do that. That wasn't true a decade ago. We can also do it local sensibilities at a price that makes sense. To go to SimCom or, or flight safety is a big deal for a lot of people, maybe too big a deal. But if you represent regional pockets of excellence for flight training, we could get to pilots. Can we get GA pilots to train like the pros? I'm going to say sure. I'm not sure what magnitude, but 3,250 people walked by a tent and said, I want to go in there and learn more. And just the other day, our friends at Mindstar ran a couple seminars, webinars. They got 5,000 looks. They got 3,000 registrants. And they got 2,000 that actually took the webinar when it was aired. 2,000 people, 5,000, 3,000, 2,000. But I'm thinking about that. 3,200 at Oshkosh, 2,000 on a webinar. 
There's, they're not the same people. We have an audience that's waiting to see what you can do to make them better pilots. And if they did come see you and take this type of curriculum, would they be better pilots? Well, of course. I mean, ask Taylor. Do you send a guy out who can shoot crosswind landings better when he's done with you? Yeah. Well, you all know this. But we also know when you look at the accident data, pro pilots don't bust up airplanes like GA pilots. We're the least resourced, least experienced, least trained pilots in the universe. So if we train them, we can only get better. So that's the pitch. Um, I don't know if I'll be invited back, because apparently there's a survey, and you guys all fill it out. And based on the weighted score you give me, I'm either a potential candidate or I'm gone forever. But if I'm lucky and I'm invited back, what I would love to be able to do is report on whether or not we had success with phase two. That phase two of bringing our voice to the subject, developing that curriculum, delivering it to you, and you'll be able to tell me whether you got any new customers. And uh, that's it. We got about one year before we meet again, and I'm thinking we can make some pretty significant progress. That's it.